Hi guys and welcome back to another true crime in makeup time video. If you're new here, my name is Zara and I post a new true crime video every single week. So if you love makeup and you love these kinds of videos, I would really appreciate it if you would consider subscribing. It would mean so much to me guys. And definitely turn the notifications on and hit the like button so you never miss another video. So today's case was requested by Brandy and I had not heard of this case before. And then when I read about it, I just couldn't stop trying to find more and more information about it. It's such a crazy case. If you're a parent or no parent, a parent's worst nightmare is child abduction or, you know, your children getting sexually assaulted. Gary, an American dad from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, unfortunately endured both. He tracked down the man who took his son and he did what I think most parents would want to do. This case also brings up whether Gary should be praised for the act that he committed or whether he should be condemned for what he did. So let's get into today's case. So Leon Gary Plouch, Plouch, I hope I'm saying that correctly, was born on 10th November 1945 in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and he briefly served in the US Air Force where he earned the rank of staff sergeant. And after leaving the army, he became an equipment salesman and then worked as a cameraman for a local news station. He married a woman named June and he had four sons with her. He had Jeffrey Michael Joseph Jody Boyce, Leon Gary Jr. and then Sissy Jennifer Laurie which sounds like a girl's name, so maybe he had a daughter instead. The two of them also made Baton Rouge, Louisiana their home, and that's where they chose to settle down and raise their family. Now, in the year 1984, the time that this um, case took place, Gary and his wife, June, they were actually separated. And at the time, Gary seemed to be having a hard time with the separation, not so much um, in regards to him and his wife, but more so he loved his sons or three sons and a daughter, like he loved his kids. And he just was having a hard time not living with them, not raising them as, you know, a family. And I understand that. All in all, Gary just seemed destined to just live a quiet, ordinary life. He didn't have anything sort of outstanding happening and he never, he seemed just like a good guy. He didn't seem like a problematic, troublesome guy. And then one day, everything just changed for Gary and changed the lives of those surrounding him. The series of events that propelled this change took place in February of 1984. At the time, his son, Joseph, who they called Jody, was taking karate lessons uh, from an instructor. And his instructor's name was Jeff Doucette, and he was 25 years old. Jeff was known to be a loner who had no close friends or family really. However, he loved his job being a karate instructor and he really idolized his students. He often considered himself a young father figure or like an older brother to his students. And he didn't limit his contact with his students to just in the classroom. He actually had deeper relationships with a lot of the students and he would often take them on skating trips or other various outings. And he was sort of known to the parents and known to do this. And I mean, I don't think this would really fly now. I mean, at least not for me, but I'm guessing in 1984, it's a smaller community and you probably know each other a little bit more. Jeff was actually good friends with the Plash family. He taught three of the four children and he was often invited to the Plash household for various dinners or other social occasions. And I'm guessing as parents, or at least my parents, if I think back to when I was in school, if my parents knew one of my teachers that well, they would probably feel so comfortable and like, oh, I really know what's going on. And when you feel super comfortable with someone that's taking care of your child or someone that's supposed to be taking care of your child, I can understand the... um sort of comfortability that these parents felt and trust that you would have in someone who is supposed to be teaching, looking after, mentoring your child. It, it, it must have felt good to know that they had someone like that around their children. Now, you know, given that that's what June and Gary were thinking of Jeff, what they didn't know was that Jeff was actually a master manipulator and a serious pedophile who had been grooming one of their sons for a period of time. Not only had Jeff been grooming 
one of their sons. Ironically, he was also technically grooming the family because he was coming into their home. He was making them feel like they had someone that was safe around their children. And I think the crazy thing about grooming a family, and I think they do this or um, Jeff was doing this so that he could have clear and free access to Jody because if the child sees that the person that's doing this to them is invited into their home and you know the parents like this person they probably think that you know, what this person is doing to them is normal and okay so at the time that this whole situation took place Jeff had been grooming and abusing and assaulting their son Jody for over a year so on 19th February 1984 Jeff comes to, so remember June and Gary were separated. So the kids were living with June in the family home. So Jeff, he comes to the family home and he speaks with June and he's like, Hey June, I'm just going to go take Jody with me to run a couple errands. I'm also just going to take him for a ride around the town and, you know, I'll be back soon. And that to me alone is weird. Like, why are you taking my son to run errands, your errands? But at the same time, they trusted him. So they were like, okay, well, June trusted him. So she was like, okay, Jeff, go ahead. See you later, Jody. Another thing Jeff told June, he said, oh, I'm just going to be back in about 15 minutes. So it's not going to be long. We're, we're just going to go for a little ride and we'll be back really soon. Jeff, again, was 25 years old and he also had a really large beard at the time and I know this probably seems irrelevant but I think um he, you know 25 is quite young so I feel like but when you're a kid that's like older you know but I feel like that also makes the perception that you're this like trusting older person so I can understand in a way why June let her son go with Jeff she knew Jeff she trusted Jeff now there was no need to doubt Jeff she trusted Jeff he was their respected karate instructor. He taught three out of their four children. He was trusted in the community as well. So there was no reason for June to sort of have any doubts or suspicions or anything like that. Jeff enjoyed spending time with the boys, the Flash boys, and the boys enjoyed spending time with Jeff. A year earlier, their son Jody told the school newspaper Jeff's all of our best friends, like, we all love him. And according to June, uh, Jody actually quit the basketball and football team um, earlier in the year so that he could spend more time with Jeff and focus on his karate. The sad thing is, is that Jody probably did this, quit these other classes under Jeff's instructions because he was being groomed for so long by Jeff. Even if Jeff had an explicit told him to do so when you're being groomed you think that this is okay and possibly he thought like I want to spend a lot more time with Jeff this is normal he comes to a house like why wouldn't I want to spend a lot of time with him and maybe at the same time he was also scared to not do what Jeff wanted or what Jeff hinted in case you know Jeff wouldn't like him anymore and Jody wouldn't be his favorite like that's a normal feeling for he was only 11. Little did June know that Jeff was not taking Jody around the neighborhood for a ride because Jeff at the time was actually battling a court case for fraud, financial fraud, and he wanted to or needed to escape the whole situation quickly. However, he was not prepared to leave his favorite student, Jody, behind. Jeff had decided that it was time for him to leave Baton Rouge and he was going to take Jody with him. That was his plan. That same day by nighttime, Jeff and Jody were already on a bus headed into the West Coast. On the way, Jeff shaved his large beard off and then he also dyed Jody's hair, like blonde hair, he dyed it black. He did all this to pass Jody off as his own son while they were hiding from law enforcement. So Jeff checks himself and Jody into a cheap motel in Anaheim just a short walk away from the Disneyland complex. Inside this hotel room, Jeff assaults Jody, which is a joke considering that, Jeff, you're on the freaking run and that's still what's on your mind. Like, 
you're on the run. You stole this child. You kidnapped this child. And now you still want to assault him like you're still in the mood for that? Like, what a freaking creep. As if abducting this poor child wasn't enough. What a douchebag. So this all continued until Jody had asked Jeff if he could call his parents. Surprisingly and stupidly, Jeff allowed him to make this call. So Jody rings his mother on 29th February 1984, which is around 10 days after he was abducted. Obviously, during this phone call, Jody reveals his location, like what motel they're at, where they're at, they're in California and in Disneyland. Like he tells his mother everything, obviously. Now, even though Jody probably trusted Jeff and, you know, was kind of like, okay, well, I'll go with you and things like that. I'm sure when he made him dye his hair, when they get on this bus and now they're leaving the city that Jody lives in, now they're in a motel. And now in this motel, now it must have clicked to Jody, like, okay, well, what he's doing is not right. And I know that sounds kind of stupid to say because, you know, he, he should have known. But I think realistically, like, it doesn't really hit you until you're like, whoa, what is he doing to me? Why are we in this hotel? Why am I away from home for 10 days? Maybe he saw something in the news. Like, who knows, you know? So I feel like that's why he revealed his location, even though it seemed like he was kind of, you know, loyal to Jeff in a way. So Jody's mom obviously alerts the police. The police go figure out the location by tracing the call. They immediately make their way there and then they raid the motel. When they got to the motel, the police arrest Jeff while Jody was immediately put on a flight back to Louisiana. And on 1st March 1984, Jody was reunited with his family. So there was a police officer named Mike Barnett, and he was one of the people that helped track uh, Jeff down. And he was also actually friends with Gary, Jody's father. So because he was friendly with Gary, he decided to take it upon himself to let Gary know what Jeff had, you know, done to his son. According to Mike, he said that Gary had the same reaction as most parents would if they ever found out their kid had been raped or molested, you know, for even if it was just the one time. And then to find out it had been going on for a year right in front of your eyes, like he was horrified. And I'm sure June was too. Gary had allegedly told Mike, I'm going to kill that son of a bitch. Gary was said to be distraught and obviously not coping well with, you know, what had happened to his son, although he was glad he was, you know, now safe and found. He could not cope with the fact that all of this had happened to Jody. Obviously, I mean, essentially June, you know, it's not that it's her fault, but as a parent, you would be like, I allowed my son to be abducted. I sent him with Jeff. Imagine what she was going through for those 10 days that Jody was missing and how her and Gary felt even after Jody was found safe. Like, I feel like as a parent, you would just never forgive yourself. Like you would continuously blame yourself. Even though he's safe, is he really safe? You know, his life is forever changed. Their son would never have a normal childhood. What's done is done. How can a child that's been abused multiple times over the period of one year ever recover, you know? The aftermath, you know, what that child may believe is normal or what he might do to himself or what he thinks of himself or what he thinks of his parents. It's all a massive burden to bear given that, you know, you have, you get pregnant, you have a child, you raise, you know, you raise this child and you do your best and then this happens. And do you guys know what I'm trying to say? Like, it's something that can never, ever be fixed. You know what I mean? So I understand that though Jody had been found, you know, technically safe, it's like, how would he ever recover from it? And as a parent, how do you, how do you ever protect that child? You feel like you, you didn't and you'll feel like you failed. So after Jody was found, Gary, you know, again, he wasn't living at the family home. So instead of just being alone at home, he spent the next few days at a local bar and he was just kind of like drinking his sorrows away. The bar was called the Cotton Club and because it was such a small town, all of this had been all over the news. So Gary, every time he was in that, in the Cotton Club, he would just ask the locals like, so when do you think, you know, Jeff's going to be brought back to Baton Rouge? Because remember, um, he was arrested in Anaheim, California. So he just kept asking the locals like, when do you think 
he's going to be brought back. And because the crime took place in Baton Rouge, you know, his trial would be in Baton Rouge. So one of these nights drinking, there was a former colleague of the WBRZ news station who was actually at the bar that night. And he heard Gary, you know, asking questions about when Jeff was going to be um, brought back to Baton Rouge for his trial. And he tells Gary, like, I have some inside scoop. I know that Jeff is going to be brought back on a flight um, from Anaheim to Baton Rouge tomorrow morning at 9.08 a.m. And that's the time his flight is going to be arriving into the airport. Gary was like, thank you. Now, the date is 16th March 1984. So a few, only like two weeks, actually, two and a half weeks since the whole incident took place where Jody was rescued from Gary's sick fantasy. This was the day that Jeff was being flown into Baton Rouge Airport for his trial. Now, he wasn't just going to be flown in, you know, by himself. He was being flown in under police guard. So Gary decides to also take a little field trip that day to Baton Rouge Airport. He enters the arrivals department wearing a hat, a baseball hat and sunglasses. And he waited in the airport, just, you know, watching all those arrive, but he wasn't just doing that for fun. He was waiting for just one person. You guys know who it is, Jeff. So he hides his face and he walks over to like an area with a bunch of payphones and he makes a phone call to his best friend, Jimmy. Now, at the same moment, there's a crew of WBRZ news reporters just, you know, piled there and waiting for Jeff's arrival into the airport because they wanted to capture this sick, twisted man who abducted a child. Like at the time, I guess you could do that. So they wanted to capture his arrival and, you know, probably ask him questions and just like have it all over the news. Now, there was going to be a caravan of cops escorting Jeff through the airport because of how um, high profile this um, crime was at the time. And therefore, the media coverage of him returning was going to be really high. Many TV crews were at the airport at the time, you know, hoping to catch a glimpse of this man who had abducted his student you know, taking him to a different state, abusing him for days, abusing him for a year prior before being caught. And in terms of media, they wanted to capture this, you know, at the airport. They wanted it like, you know, the fresh news. So now at this time, Gary is, you know, at the payphone and he's talking to his best friend, Jimmy, and he's just having a conversation with him. But the whole time he's doing this, he's just scanning the arrivals and watching, you know, who's getting off the planes. And then before he knew it, Police pass by Gary with Jeff in tow being surrounded by a bunch of police guards. Gary is facing the wall of the payphone talking to his best friend, Jimmy. He says to Jimmy, here he comes. You're about to hear a shot. Gary draws his 38 caliber revolver from his pocket, turns to Jeff, aims at his head and shoots him at point blank range in full view of the media that was present. The bullet that shot through Jeff's skull was caught on camera by the media. It was posted on YouTube and over 20 million people have watched how Jeff collapsed on the ground, bleeding from a wound that was in his head close to his ear. Gary drops the telephone receiver and police immediately like restrain him and remove him from the area. And then they also remove the gun obviously from his hand and then they go, or well, one of them goes and attends to Jeff. Now his friend Mike, who was there at the time, um, who was one of the people escorting Jeff, is the one that quickly tackles Gary to the wall. And he's like, why, Gary? Why'd you do it? Like, you can hear him yelling. And then Gary responds back, if somebody did this to your kid, you would do this too. And Gary was in tears and he did not resist arrest. And he was arrested right on the scene in the moment. At the Plouch residence, Gary's estranged wife, June, she was just coming home at the time and she turns on the news and it's all over the news. And um, the news article said an unidentified man has just shot Jeff Doucette at the airport and June's knees just buckled and she fell you know, onto the floor. I'm guessing she obviously had a feeling 
that it was Jeff and this was later confirmed when she had to go visit Gary later on that night in um, lockup. The first thing she said to Gary um, when she sees him, and I don't know if she did this out of anger because he was no longer her husband or whether she really believed this, she says to Gary, you know you're going to hell for this, right? And Gary says, I know. Now, Jeff was obviously rushed to the hospital where he fell into a coma from the gunshot wound. And the next day, while in his coma, Jeff passes away and he was now dead. Now, while he was awaiting trial, while he was in jail, uh, Gary tells his attorney, Foxy Sanders, I didn't want Jeff or I don't want Jeff to ever be able to do this to any other kid. According to Foxy, he states that Gary heard the voice of Christ that had made him pull the trigger. Although Gary, you know, had technically killed a child molester, murder was still murder in the eyes of the law. He had to be put on trial and it wasn't clear whether he was going to go free or go to prison. Foxy was adamant that Gary would not spend a day in prison after the world learned about, you know, how Jeff had been grooming Jody and grooming the Plouch family for years and about how careful Jeff was in executing his plan, getting the family to trust him, getting three children out of four of them to attend his classes and then abusing Jody and doing it without being confronted for over a year. Foxy also argued that Jody's kidnapping had pushed Gary into a psychotic state in which he was no longer capable of distinguishing right from wrong. Psychological reports actually helped Gary's case after it was uh, put forth that uh, Jeff had been abusing Jody for months prior to kidnapping him. They had determined that Gary could not tell the difference between right or wrong when he shot Jeff. It also determined that Jeff had the ability to manipulate people and took advantage of the fact that Gary and June were actually separated at the time. And by this taking place, he had managed to wedge himself into the Plouch family and cause this divide. They determined that sending Gary to prison was of no help to anyone and that it was virtually impossible for Gary to commit another crime like this. The citizens of Baton Rouge, however, didn't agree. They said that Gary was, in fact, in his right mind at the time that he killed Jeff. And I think what they mean by this is that most of the citizens were like, hell yeah, he was in his right mind. Like I too would have killed the person abusing and molesting my, chi uh, my child. That's what I think they meant by that because Gary was then charged with second degree murder, but his bail was posted and paid for by the people that supported him in the community. According to one of these locals who was a riverboat captain, his name was Murray Curry. He said Gary was anything but a killer. He was a father who had done it out of, uh, you know, the love for his child and for his pride. Like other neighbors and people in the community, Curry or Murray was one of the people that donated uh, towards Gary's bail and actually towards a defense fund that was set up for Gary to help him pay back his $100,000 bail and to also obviously help keep his family afloat during the trial as Gary wouldn't be working. The degree to which the public opinion swayed in Gary's favor was overwhelming, so much so that while the time of sentencing came at the trial, the judge decided to not send Gary to prison for murder. He said that doing so would have just been counterproductive and that he felt certain that Gary had not been intending to harm anyone apart from the already dead Jeff Doucette. So when Gary's case came to trial, he accepted the plea of manslaughter and the judge was determined that Gary was not going to spend any time for this crime. Instead, he was sentenced to a seven year suspended sentence, five years of probation and 300 hours of community service, which he did at his just local church. So before he had completed the conditions of his release, Gary was already back to living a fairly normal life in Baton Rouge. And he stayed relatively under the radar because I'm sure some people probably saw him as a killer. I'm sure the whole community wasn't in support of him. So he kind of just stayed under the radar. But in 2011, Gary suffered a stroke. And actually at the age of 67, when Gary was 67, he was asked, you know, about the crime. And I mean, 
67, he must have been in his 30s or 40s when that happened. So um, he actually gave an interview when he was 67 stating that he did not regret killing Jeff and that he would do so again in a heartbeat. Gary passed away on October 21st, 2014 at the age of 68 due to complications from the previous stroke. And this stroke was caused by diabetes. And yeah, so he passed away, unfortunately, at a fairly young age. And his obituary stated that he saw beauty in everything. He was a loyal friend to all, always made others laugh, and he was a hero to many. As for his son, Jody, he needed time to process, you know, his assault and abduction and everything that had happened to him. I mean, I'm sure it wasn't easy for him to, you know, move on with his life and then deal with everything and then and then for it to be public too I think for it to be that public it would have been pretty hard but he eventually um turned his experience into a book titled why Gary why in his book he relates his side of the story to help parents prevent what happened to him ever happening to their kids it's a detailed account from the events that took place 35 years ago and it actually tells parents what to do to protect their children from you know potential predators. The title of the book, Why Gary Why, is actually referencing what his friend Mike Barnett said to him when said to Gary when he tackled Gary after he shot Jeff. He goes, Why Gary, why? And then that's the title of Jody's book. Jody actually really enjoys cooking and he frequently shares this hobby on YouTube, but he states that the events of what took place to him, you know, so many years ago still sort of I guess haunt him because He's doing a video about cooking and people are still commenting about your father is a hero. You know, your father did the right thing. Your father, you know, your father, your father, your father. And like, I can understand it being frustrating because when you're trying to move on from it, yes, you wrote a book. I understand that. But you're trying to sort of move on from it and people keep bringing it up. Jody actually also spent several years as a sexual assault counselor in Pennsylvania. So I think that in his case, he took what happened to him and he was trying to help others from it. And that's fantastic because it's not that easy, I think, to do so and to share your story and talk about these things. Jody, who was 10 at the time when he started taking um, karate classes from Jeff, says that in his young mind, Jeff became his best friend. He said that, you know, the sexual assault didn't just start straight away. It, it had been several months before Jeff even attempted to do anything and he had just been pushing the boundary Little by little, he said that the grooming process began not only on him, but on his, you know, his entire family, his parents, his siblings. He said, pedophiles are very good at what they do. One thing they are good at is testing that child's boundaries. He said, Jeff began doing things like, we need to stretch, you know, after karate. And I'm guessing this would be when they were alone and he would, you know, stretch Jody, but then begin touching his legs. And then he would go up and up his legs. And that way, if he, you know, accidentally touched his private area, he would be like, oh, it was an accident. We were, you know, just trying to stretch. Or he said if they were driving in a car, he would just like let his hand flop onto Jody's lap and then, you know, leave it there for however long until Jody would say something to Jeff. And if Jody said something, he would be like, oh, sorry, I didn't even realize, you know, my hand was right there. I, you know, didn't mean to do it. And I don't know if I'm stupid, but I think back in the day, those cars, like they didn't have like that center console. So there was no place to like rest your hand. So I guess it's like an easy way or like the handbrake is there. It's like an easy way to sort of test the boundaries like Jody was saying. Jody then says Jeff did what he considers like a slow, gradual seduction. Then eventually he says the molestation began and he said he left a lot of stuff out of the book and his mother was like, and his mother, June, was like, why don't you put more details in there? And Jody says that he didn't want to put too much detail into the book because it's like a fine line between triggering a victim who might be reading the book and having to, you know, put the book down because whatever they're reading is too close to home or triggering a pedophile who may be reading the book and getting satisfaction from hearing about what had happened to this young child. Like, like it was a porn magazine and being like, oh, this is great. He's saying he didn't need to go into like explicit details or like the grossest, nasty stuff because he's like, you get the point. He says what he always gets questioned about is why, sorry, why people say, why didn't you tell anyone? And he's like, well, first of all, I was 10 years old. Second of all, he knew that what was happening between him and Jeff was going to upset his parents. And you think that you're going to get in trouble. You know what I mean? Like as a kid, you just don't get it. 
And then three, he didn't want Jeff to get in trouble because he was like, it's easier for me to just keep quiet and shut up than to tell my parents and let them know. And then it becomes a big hoopla and then they tell everyone. And then Jeff's like this big creep. Like, I think he didn't think what was happening was that wrong, even though he knew it was wrong, you know? So then Jody says he was actually really upset with his father, Gary, for killing Jeff because he didn't want Jeff dead. I mean, he had been groomed to see Jeff or accept Jeff as his best friend. So understandably, in a weird way, he liked Jeff, you know, but he does say he did not like the abuse and he did want Jeff to stop. But he felt that, you know, by calling his mom and letting him know and the police coming and arresting him, that was enough. Jeff going to jail was enough. Jody doesn't agree with the people that believe that his dad is a hero because, you know, he committed this act of like vigilante justice. He says that for people who are not satisfied with the American justice system, they see Gary as like a symbol of justice for them. He says his dad did what everybody says they would do if someone did that to their child, yet only a few people actually do it. Plus, his dad didn't go to jail. He says he cannot and will not condone his dad's behavior, although he understands why he did it. He says what's more important is that a parent of a child who is being abused is there for the child to support the child rather than risking prosecution and going to jail, you know? He's saying after the shooting, he was very upset with his dad, but his parents didn't force him into recovery. They kind of just let him recover at, at his own pace. And it took a long time for Jody, but eventually he was able to work through it and sort of recover in his eyes. And he could finally accept his dad, Gary, back into his life. And then he says that the family just kind of went back to normal once Jody was able to go back to normal. Jody says that his advice would be to urge parents to be more involved with their children and be wary of a adult, you know, or even like an older kid, you know, who, you know, even if it's a family member, friend, close friend, anything like that, if this adult or older kid or something like that pays an unusual amount of attention to your child or one of your children. And he says that if someone wants to spend more uh, time with your child than you do, then that's a red flag. Now, the video of Gary killing Jeff has been featured on many news stations, channels, things like that, YouTube. And Brandy, um, who suggested this case, she actually shared this video on her Facebook page. And I went and had a look. That's how I watched it. And I still can't believe a video like that was published at the time on live TV. I mean, on this video, you can clearly see Gary like turn around, point blank, shoot Jeff. And then the cameraman who's like, who captures it even like goes down and like focuses on like Jeff who's been shot, focuses on the gunshot entry wound, like the blood, like it's kind of insane. Like I was like, whoa, I can't believe this is real, like being shown. I mean, most of us don't ever get to see death up front like this, a life being taken away in the moment, like coming, like death coming out of a human. And you know, that sounds so morbid, but that's essentially what you're watching in this video. So the fact that how many children possibly saw this on live TV, like, wow. But my thoughts on Gary, okay, okay, this is hard, really hard. I know my husband would do the same thing, at least attempt to do the same thing. Me, on the other hand, have you guys seen the movie Prisoners with Hugh Jackman? I feel my anger would lead me more down that route. And I'm not going to say more. Look up the movie, look up what happens and... That's what I would do. Let's move on. It's so hard because I think most parents would agree with Gary and what he did because, and, and be on Gary's side because it's your baby, your little boy or girl, like this little baby you've protected your whole life. You know, even if they're 11, they're still your baby. Being hurt by a sicker, let, al let alone groomed in front of your very eyes. Like how infuriating is that? You would for sure blame yourself too. I'm sure June and Gary themselves had to struggle with a lot of issues. Like what the fuck? He was paying so much attention to Jody. Like why didn't we see this coming? Why didn't we pay more attention? And honestly, in my experience, my mom, she's put me on high alert since I was a little girl. I have had like a handful of incidents where I guess grooming was sort of attempted on me or, you know, possible molestation attempts, I guess. And my mom always taught me to tell her even before anything happened. Like I was a hella snitch, hella snitch, still am. So I would always tell her like if any guy was kind of weird with me, or even a woman was weird with me, I would like tell her, I'd be like, mom, uh, how do I say this without saying too much? <laughs> Therefore, because of how my mom raised me, I am on high alert. We need to teach kids to get help when needed and that it's never their fault and it's totally okay. And you know, we will deal with it. 
together. I hope that makes sense. I feel like Gary would have been having this battle with himself in his eyes, you know, letting Jeff go to jail, let alone exist in this world after doing that to his son. And realistically, how long would he have gone to jail for? You know, he was only 25. If it was 10 to 15 years, he could have come out at still a prime age, ready to do this to more, more people, possibly come back for Jody. Anyway, <laughs> let me know your thoughts on this case down below, guys. Thanks so much to Brandy again for bringing this case to my attention. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video, found it interesting. If you're still here and you haven't subscribed, what are you waiting for? Go ahead, subscribe. And I will see you in the next one, guys. Besitos. Bye.